E3 2018 finished up this past week, and like any good little podcast, we're here to talk about it. Welcome to the Lollygaggers Podcast. In this episode, Jeff slobbers over Cyberpunk 2077 and After Party, while Justin dreams of Spider-Man 4 and Fallout 76. Both Lollygaggers then break down the new Marvel TV show Cloak and Dagger, and end with the Gentleman's Challenge. All right, welcome to episode number 13 of the Lollygaggers podcast, a show about all sorts of different geek things, games to movies, movies to TV, comics, etc. I am one of your hosts, Jeff. I'm the other one, Justin. How's it going? Hey, man. It's going all right. How you doing, man? I'm good. Uh, came from a, a, a football camp this weekend at my old alma mater. Went to UCF for a little camp. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, pretty sure it was on the face of the sun it's just nice. so hot it's unbelievable how hot it is here in the summer how's sure. the heat treating you over there in arizona i don't go outside so i don't know i think it's hot i'm not sure it's just your yeah. I, i'm taking the thermometer's word for it if, mm-hmm. if you step outside are you just gonna explode is that what happens over there it's like three digits man like it's almost, actually we had <laughs> we had storms the past couple of days but like storms for us means like there's thunder clouds in the sky but like there's no there's no actual precipitation nothing actually comes down and hits the ground so it's kind of funny but yeah that's about it worst part about us is like once you get into like central florida like center of the state there's just no breeze at all and it's like you're just sitting in a pressure cooker it's just all this humidity just sitting in your face no relief it's just uh... anyways enough about the happy stuff florida uh oh hey so yeah. big news before we get into what we're doing and i already told you this but i want to mention that in the air uh i uh I got into the Magic the Gathering Arena Yay! beta test. And I'm going to begin uh, probably either later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, my goal, as is the goal of our friend Gabe, to uh, to beat the pants off you and the one thing happen. that you're good at so that we can just ruin like just ruin everything that there is good about happen. you. not going to happen. Every little... <laughs> Don't take this one thing. And we're just going to take it from you. That's what we want. Yeah, Listen, I'm, I'm bad at most things in my life, but magic I'm pretty decent at. I don't know if that's something I can really hang my hat on, but I'm going to do it. So I, I opened up all my digital decks. I looked at all these digital cards. Didn't understand any of them. Uh, <laughs> very confusing. None of them were Black Lotus cards. I'm very, very sad. Where's the Black Lotus at? <laughs> that's like the only card I remember other than like lands. That's about it. That's all I did. I told Justin, I'm like, I don't know how to tap my land, so I keep turning my monitor sideways, uh, but it's not, it's not working. Yeah, well, so, but anyway, yeah. uh, when, and I'm not saying, I'm saying when, not if, when I finally uh, do beat the yeah, crap out of yeah, Justin yeah, yeah. and his favorite game, I will be sure to let uh, the podcast know, because it will be a very important date. It'll be very important. It'll probably happen for Gabe a lot quicker. He's really good at games. Uh, he's, so, uh, like, he's playing very diligently right now. He might, or... he might already be able to beat you, like, uh, yeah. I feel. I probably think, like, if, if i want to yeah. what i want to do is hand him us like the build for a solid deck and then really play him see how he does just because then it's just at that point it's just rng yeah. and skill so i'd like to see that so sure I might just do that. Anyways, rng and skill see things that are completely different from one another yeah i mean so. this, there's a lot of rng in the computer game in real life mm-hmm. you can kind of control a lot of that stuff but in the real in yeah. the computer game it's very rng so sadly though we have to wait because there's no matchmaking system yet like we can't justin and i can't pair up in a game yet so it's just sort of random so i'm playing randos he's playing randos and hopefully we'll come across one another or they'll implement like a like an actual matchmaking system soon so that'd be i'm nice. sure they're gonna implement one soon i mean next big I patch so. i wouldn't doubt it they did that yeah yeah but it looks good i'm looking forward to it i haven't played magic since like the mid to late 90s like i, I started playing magic within a year or two of it like first kind of coming out and I played for maybe a year and then I stopped um, uh, and did other things. I can't remember what it was I got into after that, but I just kind of uh, stopped Girls playing. probably, probably got into girls. So, no, wow. it was something else. I think it was, I think I started playing a sport at high pogs? school. Pogs? I think it was Pogs. If it's 90s, it's got to be Pogs. <laughs> I think, I think it was drugs. It might've been drugs. Okay. It's, it's it either, drugs. it's either Magic the Gathering or Hardcore Heroin. It's got to be. I know. I, uh, because I can't remember, it must be drugs. That's probably what it was. So, anywho, uh, so, okay, this episode uh, comes on the heels of E3. Uh, so, E3 conference just finished up uh, this past week. Uh, so, it was last weekend. We, we couldn't quite, it was kind of going on right when we were, uh, we were recording the last, pod, the last episode of the podcast. We really didn't want to talk about it too much then. We figured we'd just talk, kind of talk about it here. 
So what we're going to do in our opening rundown here is just kind of go over a couple of the highlights that uh, Justin and I had, like certain things, you know, certain games or announcements, stuff like that, uh, and just kind of talk about what we're looking forward to. Probably be a, hopefully a fairly quick segment, but uh, but Justin, is there something you want to want to get us started with? So one of the biggest things I was looking forward to, forward to this entire time was uh, Spider-Man 4, because uh, I've been looking for a good Spider-Man game since, like, PlayStation 1, because the last good one was, like, Spider-Man 2, Amazing Spider-Man 2, like, a long time ago. But, like, there's a new one coming out. It's made by Insomniac. Um, they're the same ones that do um, Psychonauts and stuff. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's completely open world. Kind of like a Batman situation, which which makes a lot of sense. You know, these these superhero games. I, I like that idea of like Batman, Arkham Asylum, whatever. We can kind of like explore and then do things on the street, kind of like GTA style, but then also uh, do your main missions. So it's kind of like a, a twist on that. The mechanics of like the fighting looks amazing, but one thing I did notice when I was watching like the demo of it, it sure looked like Spider Man was murdering a whole bunch of people. Like he's like. Kicking people nice. off the top of skyscrapers. I'm like, nice. That guy's dead. He's not going to make it put, He probably put like webs at the bottom. Yeah, so that see, gonna land before the fight, he put like a little canopy around the outside. I mean, let's be honest. Building. I mean, those movies are incredibly realistic yeah, 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 uh, yeah. about how gravity works and the, uh, the the strain the human body can take when they fall. Uh, but yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah one, of the, one of the things we were talking about uh, when we were watching, because we it was me, Gabe... Ruben and Logan all watched the Sony conference together, and um, we were ta- we were watching that thing and like, oh, he's murdering all these people, and people think about you know we were saying like, just him punching a normal person would probably kill him, right? Because like, if he's got the equivalent strength of a spider and he can punch like a hole in a car, if he just punches a normal bad guy in the head, that's like serious brain damage that he's doing there. Sure. And like, sure. I brought up during the conversation like. They actually brought that up in the comic book. That's how Dr. Octavius died, because he took too many shots to the head. So maybe oh. maybe it's a, it's a thing. Anyways, oh. looks cool. The combat looks awesome. Comes out in September. I'm really looking forward to playing it. And also doesn't look spooky. So that's a big plus for me. <laughs> what uh, what systems is it coming out on? It's only PlayStation 4. It's a PlayStation 4 exclusive. So I'm looking forward to that. And like, yeah. seems like they have the Sinister Six thing going on because they have Electro, Scorpion, Rhino, Vulture. Uh, there was, I forget the last one they had. But like, it's, it's all Sinister Six. And then there's oh, Mr. Negative. And then they have one guy that they haven't shown yet, which I'm assuming is probably going to be Green Goblin. I mean, so it seems the most... is Mr. Negative just the guy who just walks around and says, like, you can't do anything with your life. You know, we shouldn't go there. <laughs> what do you even do? What are you even starting for? Expensive. You're pointless. This is stupid. His, his superpower is just to just just to be contrarian. Just to be like, yeah, no. He's just, he's no, just a pessimistic at all times. Like, yeah. it's dumb. No, he's it's just. Like... Out. No, it's not. It's not that bad. <laughs> but he's, he's kind of like a, a, a mob boss type of thing. And so, like, for me, for, like, I love the Spider-Man lore and all this stuff. It's going to be exciting. I'm really looking forward to the game. Um, what's a game that you saw that you liked? Okay, so, uh, by far, the biggest uh, piece of news coming out of E3, uh, I've been pretty pumped for this for a while. Madden, 19, Cyber- Madden 2019. <laughs> Dude, I haven't played a Madden game since, like, 2004, 2005. I think the last football game I played uh, was the college football one. Yeah, I always And they stopped the making those, ones, too. Yeah, I know. I always prefer the college games. Uh, Buddy and I in college, uh, we used to play campaigns together. Uh, and so we'd pick like really bad teams and we just like, we just played the campaigns together. It was pretty fun. But no, 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 it was not Madden. Uh, I am super excited about Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, that looks really C interesting. Project Red. So this is the same company that does the Witcher series, uh, which you haven't played, right? Right? You haven't played sorry, The Witcher? Yeah, uh, they. I, I played the second one. I wasn't okay. a huge fan of it. I need to play the third one. What? I the third one's, third one's amazing. The second one's fantastic. I just haven't really had a chance to really get into it, but I really want to play the third one. So you I know Project Red's like really knocking out of the park. And just like something like 10 years ago, they were a nobody company and they were like had a small, tiny booth at E3 with just like a yeah. piece of paper as their sign. And now they're like one of the most respected uh, like video game companies in the yeah. world. So. Well, I mean, they've really done like it's amazing tracking the growth of the Witcher series because I remember, I remember buying the Witcher 
way back, maybe within a year of it releasing, like the very first one. And I started playing it. I'm like, what is this? I can't like the, the combat controls were kind of weird. And uh, I mean, the graphics were okay at the time, I suppose, but they're a little bit clunky and stuff like that. But I just couldn't get, I just couldn't get over the controls for some reason. Uh, and so I put it away, I didn't play it. And another year goes by, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna try to play this again. And I actually stuck with it and I loved it. And then I played Witcher 2, which I loved. And then I played Witcher 3, which is like one of the greatest games I've ever played. So CD Projekt Red, however, is tackling Cyberpunk 2077, which is based off a tabletop role-playing game from, I think, the 80s. Uh, and it's, a, as the name would imply, it's a cyberpunk game, right? So a lot of people know about this. It was a fairly big um, kind of, when I say revealed, like there's a couple things that came out. First of all, there's the trailer that came out. And then some of the, I guess there was a demo that uh, some of the people in Z, the tech media were getting yeah, to see. Yeah, it was game, behind, behind closed doors. It was like a 15-minute yeah. thing. So we don't get to really see much of it, uh, but you can read about it and catch some um, and catch some clips, and you can look at the actual like trailer for it. So it's basically it's a game about the future. It's got mega corporations. It's got what they call psycho gangs. It's uh, it's set in a particular city, uh, which is pretty cool. And you're just it's you're sort of exploring it. It strangely kind of gave me like a weird GTA vibe in a way, how it's like a like a, it's like one city, and you're just exploring the various aspects of it. Uh, and I think they even mentioned that it kind of had uh that like that was sort of the intention like the idea like this is one really big city and you're just sort of exploring it and do certain stuff now um the lead character is like so you play a specific character they're named v but um they're just like a mercenary who just starts working uh as a uh, as a mercenary within the city at the start of the game but the difference between this game and the witcher is that um because the witcher was based upon like an existing ip of, of books and like Geralt was you know an actual person you know an actual character and he was the one that you're playing like you, you, when you play The Witcher, you're pretty much limited to being, you know, Geralt. You didn't really get a whole lot of customization options. I mean, you can build your, you can build them different ways. You can focus on like mutations or focus on swordsmanship or focus on grenades or whatever. But, um, but, but you still look primarily the same. Uh, even though the third one gave you some slight variations in terms of like hairstyle and like beards and stuff like that, you're still Geralt. So, uh, but in this one, there's going to be like actual character creation, and so you can choose your own gender, you can choose appearance, you can choose like a background that's apparently going to have some sort of implications or consequences to gameplay later on uh and so like you could do kind of similar to a tabletop role-playing game you should like develop stats right so it's not just stats but it's also like the like the physical thing like what does your character look like so there's all sorts of hairstyles skin color faces body type so that's really cool i like that one of the stats is cool which actually harkens back to the old uh, uh rpg um it's kind of hard to explain but it's basically like it's trying to quantify like like how how like badass you look and how people are going to react to you so that kind of thing mine would um, be very very high if it's like well i think it's based upon like oh, the, the description i was reading it was like it was based upon like what you're wearing what you're using what you're carrying and how you look doing it uh, there's also going to be a class system apparently but you don't pick your class right off the bat um and they named techie uh netrunner and solo so far but i don't think that's exhaustive i'm not, I'm not sure if that's exhaustive i really don't know uh, there's going to be romances, uh, but they want like complicated relationships, and uh, so like you can kind of it's it should have an influence over the course of the game. So I, hopefully it's going to be a little bit more evolved um, and more interesting than like you know Mass Effect Mass style Effect, RPGs. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, so one of the th I guess the big things that people were complaining about, um, if there was a complaint, was the fact that it was a, it's a first person RPG. So it's actually you actually run around in a first person viewpoint, whereas in The Witcher it's more like a third person viewpoint. So um, like because you're you're always kind of seeing you know, Geralt in front of you when you're running around or you're riding Roach or something like that. Uh, but in this game, with the exception of with when you're like driving, which can be third person, but when you're running around on your own, it's it's, it's first person. It doesn't really bother me. I don't mind it at all. I'm not. I prefer like, first person myself. I don't. Like I play I play person. Morrowind and and Skyrim and Oblivion all first person. So it really doesn't impact me one or the other. As long as it's a game, I don't really care. So I don't really have like some specific preference on that. Uh, so yeah, it looks really good. Um, I love cyberpunk as a genre. It's like between that and like traditional space opera, those are like my two favorite kind of genres of, of you know, I don't know, like fiction or, or sci-fi, you know, sci-fi slash fantasy. Like I really like those types of things. So plus it's CD Projekt Red and I'm a huge fan of the Witcher games. Uh, I put way more time into the Witcher 3 than I probably should have. And I played through the Witcher 2 like multiple times as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there's no specific release date uh, yet. So, uh, but it's, 
next year probably 2019 specifically when we don't really know but anyway that's that's by far my number one uh so what about you man what else uh, you the next one i saw that i really like is fallout 76 um i've really been getting into the uh fallout games lately i really like the lore and all mm-hmm. the stuff around it. it's actually pretty interesting and so again it's it's created by bethesda bethesda i thought had a pretty good presentation um they had skyrim they had uh fallout 76 and a couple other games here and there but uh, basically, it takes place in West Virginia, uh, and apparently the map is like ten or like sixteen times bigger than the last map that they've had. So, um, and there's the trailer's like a, got that. Uh, was it, is it John Denver? Yeah, is John, John Denver. John, John Denver. Song? John, I don't know if it's actually John Denver's version, but like it's definitely the song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's got a multiplayer aspect to it, and that intrigues me a lot. I don't know if it's MMO. They haven't necessarily gone into that too much, whether it's MMO or just like um, co-op or whatever. But either one I think would be good because me and you did Elder Scrolls Online. And I liked mm-hmm. Elder Scrolls Online, but the problem was that leveling was quite repetitive and endgame sure. really wasn't there yet. There wasn't much to endgame. Well, we never, in all fairness, we never got anywhere yeah. close to endgame. Like we were, I think we 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 peered out in the '30s. So we yeah, but like when, when we're doing that, and it's like repetitive, and then we found out that like there's no end game yet. The right. carrot wasn't there, you know. <laughs> so it's just like right. this was the point. Um, right. I liked the but our kitty cats were fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I, I, mean I liked the uh, the world and what they did. I thought it was interesting, but I just mm-hmm. thought the 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 questing system was just so bland and boring. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which no, a lot of them can yeah, be, yeah, yeah. but like games like Warcraft and other stuff have really improved how they did a lot of that stuff. And that was just, it seems really behind the curve. A lot. Well, I mean, Elder Scrolls Online was doing a lot of the phasing concepts that like WoW kind of was yeah, 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 yeah. many years ago with I think like the Northrend expansion. They started doing it maybe maybe earlier, but I know they had a lot of that going on. Um, so... But at the same time, like I totally agree. Like when you when you play like a like the open like the open world nature of like Skyrim or or like Oblivion or whatever, and then you go and you start playing Elder Scrolls, which is more of like like the pit stop. Like okay, I'm at this new little village, and here are this you know the six people with exclamation points over their heads. So let me go collect these quests. It's kind of like kind of a a weird juxtaposition of those two yeah. things. But I, overall, though, I still think it was actually a, it was a fun it was game. Actually an underrated game. I do feel like it's underrated. And I, I like it the way it looks. Innovative, but underrated. I, yeah. I like the art style and I like the way it looked. Mm-hmm. I like the way it played. I like the combat system and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like with this Fallout seventy six thing, like if it's MMO, I think they would have learned their lessons from Elder Scrolls Online, so it'll probably be better prepared for that type of thing. Or if it's just co op, that seems super fun to me because these games are so big. They're so big. Like they, you know, they mentioned Elder Scrolls six or whatever, whatever number it is. And like I'm thinking about that game, like. They give me anxiety how much stuff you can actually do in these games. Like, I started Fallout 4 a little while ago, and I never finished it because, you know, the, the actual game, the storyline wasn't very long, but, like, you can do so many things with so many settlements in so many different places. It's just, it gives me anxiety. So, like, if I can go play with, like, you or, like, with Gabe or with whoever, I think it'd be super fun to like be in this world and like it takes place before all the other fallouts it's like the first shelter that opens. right it's like a little prequel ish yeah kind of. so so there's no super mutants but i like to see a lot of this stuff and there's, there's robots on stuff which will be interesting but like i really i like this universe i think this universe is really cool a, a really interesting like post-apocalyptic thing um it, it's really I'm a little is... skeptical of what i've heard so far to be honest um because i know it's an entirely online game but that's honestly i feel like i don't really get upset with that anymore like you, know, you always have to be online like to play because i just feel like I'll, to some degree a lot of times that, that ship is sort of shail, sailed on uh, to a certain degree but like one of the things i was reading is that the game doesn't have any interactive npcs uh which is kind of really strange and so pretty much all characters that you meet like i'm on there like i'm on like the wiki for uh like the for fallout 76 and almost all characters you, you meet are like other players they're calling it a soft core survival game, so I don't so know. It's like, like a, it's like a sandboxy Age of Conan, type I, of thing. which is which is to me like I, I want to know like how like is there like is there story to it? Like is there actually going to be a narrative to it, or is this more going to be like a really advanced kind of uh, 
like kind of Minecraftian Terraria type of thing? Like, is there going to be? Which I, which I like stuff like know. that, you know. And... I do too, but I don't know if I like that in my Fallout games. I, I don't know. Yeah, I could be wrong. Like, uh, on the one hand, like I say that, and I feel like I'm being silly because on the other hand, I'm like, okay, well, you're right. I think the universe of Fallout is pretty rich, and so like we can actually have different types of games within the same universe. So even if I'm not, even if it's not necessarily my type of game, I still, you know, when I think about it, it's still probably a good idea that they're exploring different ways of actually, you know, kind of getting into the universe of Fallout. So I also should note that if you really like Fallout, Justin, there are, uh, there are two tabletop options that you now have available to you for the Fallout game. There's a, there's a Fallout board game uh, by, uh, by Fantasy Flight uh, that, that is, is pretty solid, I hear. I haven't played it yet. And then there's a, then there's a tabletop miniatures skirmish game, and I can't remember who's doing this one. Uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but that's going to be more like in the in the realm of like you know like a like an Age of Sigmar, like a Warhammer 40k kind of like actual milit you know militaristic terrain and uh, kind of tabletop like war game, so to speak. So those are options if you're interested in going the tabletop route, exploring the Fallout universe some more. So anyway, how to get that in there? I mean, uh, the tabletop stuff. I wish I could play the tabletop stuff more because I like that. Like I played War Machine with my brother, and Warhammer's fun, but like I don't have anyone to play with. The board game thing seems more interesting, uh, but yeah. I don't know if my wife would be into that too much. But I wish I could play tabletop. I just can't because yeah. no one else is willing to paint miniatures around me. So what? Oh, yeah. The painting miniatures is so much fun. You you could do it yourself. I don't yeah. disagree with you. Anyways, yeah. what else did you hear that you liked? All right, so another game uh, I have been looking forward to. It's a smaller game. Uh, it's called After Party. Uh, it's by the makers of a game called Oxenfree that came out um, almost two years ago, I think. Uh, it's by a studio. It's by a company called Night School Studio. Uh, and so their last game, Oxenfree, was like a like this side-scrolling kind of social conversation game where like you and your friends uh, were like wandering around what basically was a haunted island and solving mysteries and learning about the lore of the island and had all sorts of weird like time travel stuff. It was an amazing game. It was awesome. It was kind of low key in a sense, like you can kind of just chill and, and, and play it. But like, like there were like little puzzly things you had to figure out, but most of it was just kind of story driven and conversation and weird. And I really liked that. And so after party is kind of their next, uh, their next game coming out. And so here's the premise. Uh, two friends named Milo and Lola uh, are, quote, newly minted college grads. And I'm getting this from a screenshot from one of the, uh, one of the trailers that they, they put out. Uh, but then they die, they go to hell, and they have to try to find a way to drink their way out of hell. So at the start of the game, you're at a, you're at a college party. You think they oh, yeah, think they're I at a college party. I saw this one. This one was really yeah. cool looking. Oh, I like so the good. Way. The art style is so neat. Art style is fantastic. So cool. Yeah, yeah. It 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 sort of is taking the same style of game and almost the same style of art from Oxenfree, but it's doing something that's a bit more fantastical. Obviously, because like Oxenfree was very real world, like you were, you know, on an island and you're dealing with people. Here, you're in hell, and it's like this kind of cartoonish. They use the they actually even use the word in an interview I listened to, where they say like Pixarian kind of in a way, uh, kind of a tone, um, but. At the start of the game, like you're at a college party, like at your your standard college party, and they're drinking and all that kind of stuff, and they think everything's the same, but all of a sudden, like everyone's dead, and it's just like demons are messing with you, and you're actually in hell. So you're in hell, but it's it's funny. So the, it's supposed to be sort of a funny game, and like there's it's all about like the two friends. Like Milo wants to be like a social person, but it's kind of awkward, and Lola doesn't really care about that stuff, and wants to be like you know wants to change the world in some way. And so the game is really about them um, actually drinking their way out of hell, kind of finding a loophole that lets them get back to the land of the living. And they're doing a variety of literal drinking games, okay? And, and you're engaging with the various denizens of hell and having conversations. Uh, so, like, there is one scene I, was, I, I watched where they, you were playing beer pong. Uh, and there's, like, a karaoke thing. Apparently there's, like, some sort of DDR type thing. And, like, an Indiana Jones thing where Marion, in the beginning of... Uh, of uh what's it called raiders of the lost ark is like having like the drink off competition that kind of stuff and stacking glasses uh, and so that's really like fantastic it's hilarious uh it's also very non-linear that they're saying uh so you're they want players to kind of go where they want to go and so you don't actually have to play uh play the game in one particular order you can kind of go to different locations and it's very story driven um in hell during the day demons and devils kind of do the normal stuff which is like they torture people etc cetera, etc cetera. but at night uh, they co-mingle with humans and bars and stuff, and, like, they kind of coexist. 
Uh, so it looks like a really fun little game. Um, I, if you've ever played Oxenfree, it's the same company and it's, they're kind of taking what they did in Oxenfree to a new level, the kind of dialogue tree, the time dialogue interactions, uh, which always, you know, they tend to have consequences and stuff like that as the game progresses, which is really, really interesting. Except this, this theme is, is really playful and kind of really bizarre. And it's this wonderful mesh of, uh, of, of kind of ideas of, like the actual concept of hell, but like making it kind of in a funny, almost satirical light where they're kind of making fun of the way in which, you know, people's perceive this kind of thing, but also the kind of the, the silliness of like this, they were at a college drink, you know, you know they, had, they had a party, they were at like a frat party or something like that. So, uh, but there is a, there's some videos out now for after party. Uh, you can kind of take a look at it. And if you haven't played Oxenfree yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, it you can probably find it fairly cheap at this point since it's been out for a little while. And with a lot of the summer sales going on, I'm sure Oxenfree, I, I would guess Oxenfree might, might, you know, get to get a discount here or there, but after party is coming in 2019, I think fairly early, it's going to be on PC. It's going to be on Xbox. It's going to be on PS4 and it's even going to be on switch. I know, I don't, I don't, I know you and I don't use switch, but like, that's kind of cool though. It's not a game that seems to be uh, kind of very system reliant. It's not graphically heavy or anything like that. So uh, I think a lot of, a lot of systems will be able to play it, but after party looks really cool. Yeah, there's a bunch of little indie games I'm looking forward to. Like, there's a new Ori game coming out. The original Ori yeah. was amazing. Like, the yeah. music's fantastic, and it looks like it's like almost the same, or, but they added, like, new moves and stuff like that, which I'm really looking forward to, because what was cool about the game was just the mobility of it, and I saw Oxenfree, too. I was like, this is really weird and cool. I like it, so... Or not Oxenfree, it's yeah, really good. Like, after it's really good. Whatever, so. Anyways, um, the last thing I kind of want to talk about was the overall presentations of the E3. Like, they did this big spectacle of these presentations, right? You know, each each group comes out. I think it was first, uh, first it was EA, and all their stuff was who cares because it's EA. EA's just getting crapped on left and right because of what they did with Battlefront and that every game they do is just a money grab. Um, I, 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 aren't they in, in front yeah. of Anthem? I thought they were doing Anthem too, aren't they? It's, uh, okay. That's Bioware. Oh, it's I'm Bioware. not sure. Are they separate? If, are they separate or not? I, I think they might be this. I think they might be under the same thing. So like, they show stuff on Anthem, and Anthem was okay, but like, I don't, I can't trust EA anymore with whatever they like. Since all the Call of Duty stuff, all the, the, the FIFA and Madden stuff is this the same stuff recycled every year? It's just so boring now. Like. And they just charge out the wazoo for it. I just I can't take it. So EA was just like, man, who cares? Microsoft was good because they had a lot of like indie games, which which I think they Microsoft is really excelling in that. Like their their um their console exclusives are not great anymore, right? They oh they got Halo and Gears of War, and those just are not heavy hitters anymore. I don't think Halo they had they had a a video that was about it and then gears of war i just i've never cared about gears of war so like their exclusivities don't really make their their presentations but all the stuff they have the for their indie stuff like what's available on their xbox uh live stuff that's where they really excel that's where you get like after party and ori and all that stuff and all these little indie games that they they really support like they're very much I like got the same line almost as Steam when it comes to like all these indie games. But that was really cool. Uh, Ubisoft. Ah, another Assassin's Creed was the same thing that you see every year. Assassin's Creed has just become the new Madden. I just can't take it. There's a new Division 2. Ah, we never played the first one. We played like a little bit, right? Did yeah, we did. It? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I played it. Uh, I played I just, it. Um, eh. it, was, it was fine. I mean, my biggest issue... I like the theme, I like the idea of it, but like the way it was implemented, like I can't stand the whole bullet sponging thing. Like I'm shooting this yeah. guy with like this crazy gun and I'm seeing numbers kind of come out with it, which I'm nervous because I think Cyberpunk is doing something similar. Um, but it's just sort of like, you know, I don't know. Like, especially when you're, you're coming fun. from when you're coming from Rainbow Six Siege and it's like yeah. two or three shots in the right place, kill somebody, and then you go into this game. I'm like, I just unloaded eight billion bullets into yeah. this guy. Yeah. His boss That's, is only down to sixty percent. Yeah. I understand we're in a post apocalyptic world. We're supposed to kind of like ex- extend our disbelief and all that, but that was just kind of like I threw three grenades yeah. at him and he's still not dead. That was like, what? but it's not like post apocalyptic, like Fallout post apocalyptic. Yeah. It's post- apocalyptic like you know in a week or two like yeah. that like that's kind of what it is you know like this could legitimately happen within a week or two so i think the second one's set in dc right like that's where they're setting the i next think thing. so yeah 
and it looks was... it looks interesting, but like I didn't like the first one. So unless and the thing is too, like with those big MMOs, like we've learned this in the past, if there's not someone to play with you on a regular basis or a group of people to play with you, it gets real boring. Like when we did yeah. Elder Scrolls, it was just boring because it was me and you. When we yeah. got back into WoW, that was really fun. Yeah, when it was when it was yeah, with when it was with friends, but then like everyone right. left at the Christmas and stuff. And I, I get that, but like unless you're with buddies, it's really boring. Sure. Um, they also they did they're doing like a documentary on Siege. Like I don't care about a documentary. Why are you telling me this? Just I want is there more stuff you're gonna show for Siege? Like that'd be cool if you showed some like new operators, but they showed nothing for Siege. Um, they um, they unloaded a new free to play version of For Honor, so. Gabe and uh, Logan have been playing it like crazy. It's is it always? Game. Is it going to be f- like free to play, or is it just like a weekend? I thing? think it was just that particular time. I think it's a limited access okay. type of thing. Right. But that, that was just kind of like their way of trying to get people to to play it more, I guess. Well, they have but, dedicated servers now, so that, yeah, that, that's nice. So. It's a it's a it's a fun game. It's just like. A lot of Ubisoft games, when they first come out, when they launch stuff, they just don't seem fully prepared. When Siege came out, it was a mess. And the same for For Honor. I thought For Honor just lag-wise was kind of tough to deal with. Plus, I'm terrible at those games, so it didn't help me out either. So I just I know, I'm horrible at fighting, but I really committed to it. I really committed to it. It's that fun. Game. I really tried. Uh, what else is there? Uh, Sony. I, I loved Sony's uh, presentation because, first off, The Last of Us looks amazing, even though I'm pretty sure 90% of that is just not real or gameplay at all. Um, if that's gameplay, it might be the most revolutionary game of all time because it looks amazing, uh, but it's probably not. Uh, Last of Us looked interesting. I like how they did that little church thing in the beginning with the little banjo playing. Um, I, I liked the way they presented all these different places they all these different things they do like like uh bring people out and do this like Ubisoft had a guy like fall over a podium and stuff and like they try and make, like I get it you're trying to make a spectacle of it but like for me for what I like my taste I just like just show me I guess if I, if I was going there I'd want to see a spectacle but like for me for me watching the outside and just show me so that's what Sony did they're just like here's the stuff here's what we got coming and they had those little like 30 second vignettes in between of like funny little instrument players but i liked it and the ghost game looks amazing the uh like uh, samurai one uh spider-man 4 what else was that i said that i can't remember uh that hideo kojima game uh death stranding looks amazing but also confusing so that'll be interesting to play and uh there's a couple others but i thought sony was my favorite and Bethesda had their stuff, and uh, mm-hmm. they, that was pretty much it. Like uh, then, Mar and then uh, uh, Super uh, Nintendo had uh, Super Smash Brothers, and they had a few other things. But like Nintendo wasn't like breaking the mold of anything, which I think was a little bit disappointing. But, like their biggest thing was Super Smash Brothers. So, and I like the game, but you know, a lot of those people that play Super Smash Brothers are pretty hardcore, and I am nowhere close to what those guys do. So. It's interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to playing some of these games. I don't have a Switch yet, so that's a thing for me, too. Like, if me and the wife ever decide to take a big trip, maybe we'll splurge and get a, a Switch so I can just play it on the way we're doing stuff. But, like, right now there's no need for me to get a Switch. But mm-hmm. overall, I like Sony's the most. Um, I thought EA stinks the most, mostly because I hate their games, and I just don't think that they have the... I, I, I feel like they just don't get... The consumer at all they're just their bottom line and I, I get that from their presentations too so anyways any final thoughts from you well there was one other game i wanted to quickly mention because i don't think either of us mentioned it uh it was uh resident evil 2 remake uh i'm not sure if you saw any of this but ruben's uh, very excited about this yeah well ruben and i we always geek out about resident evil like because i think between him and i we're the, the biggest resident evil fans but resident evil 2 is my favorite resident evil game and I actually uh, got him into backing the Resident Evil 2 board game on Kickstarter a couple months ago uh, that was put up there. So that's kind of funny. But anyway, Resident Evil 2, really quickly, there's not a ton of content, not a ton of info here. But what I'll say is a few things. One, the remake looks amazing. Uh, Not only is there a trailer out, but there's like a video floating around of 20 minutes worth of actual gameplay footage or roughly that uh, that looks really good. 
Uh, biggest things is that it's not using that third person tank control that is from Resident this Evil. Is the two, worst like, ever. Which was like honestly the worst thing. It drove me nuts. I I stuck with it and finished it. Finished the game a couple times, but like, oh my goodness. Uh, but it's instead using kind of an over the shoulder Resident Evil Four kind of thing, uh, which is good. It's also using the same engine that uh, Resident Evil Seven used. So and Resident Evil Seven looks pretty good. So yeah, I uh, think that's working. yeah. Uh, there's, they're not really changing the story much at all. Still Claire Redfield, still Leon Kennedy. Um, it still has like the police headquarters and Raccoon City, still has liquors, etc. Um, there is potential for it to possibly come to PSVR. Like it actually might come to virtual reality, which would be insane. Uh, I think people would wet their pants, uh, but that could be fun. Uh, I don't have that yet, but I know, uh, I, know our I just want to watch Gabe play it then. If that's what's yeah. going to happen, I got to watch him play it so bad. So, but it looks really good. Uh, I am a huge fan of it and I can't wait. Uh, I haven't played Resident Evil 2 in a really, really long time, uh, but uh, it's coming out in January, I think for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna do a PC port or anything like that, but looks pretty good. Uh, if you get on the interwebs, uh, look look for that. Like it's about a 20 minute video and it's floating around a different, couple of different places. Uh, I've seen of Resident Evil 2. It's mostly gameplay footage here and there, but it looks fantastic. looks really, really good. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, that are basically our takeaways, just impressions that we saw of various uh, games and presentations at uh, good old E3. So on that note, we're going to go ahead and uh, do our little breakdown for the week. It's the movie. Breakdown. Cloak and Dagger is a new television show airing on Freeform. It can also be found on Hulu. Uh, it's created by Joe Pakowski, or Pakowski, I'm not sure. Uh, the show is based on Marvel Comics characters and is apparently set within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Olivia Holt and Aubrey Joseph star as Tandy Bowen, who's Dagger, and Tyrone Johnson, who's Cloak, both of whom develop powers following childhood tragedies, and they become interconnected. Uh, now, the first episode details these strategies. So Tandy loses her, her father, Tyrone, uh, his brother, at roughly the same time in roughly the same place, kind of triggered off the same uh, inciting incident. Um, now, the series then flashes forward to their teenage years, and it finds Tandy as kind of a semi-homeless con, semi -homeless con artist, uh, and Tyrone as kind of a now-only child that's dealing with familial expectations and is haunted by his brother's killer and the pressures of just sort of, of being like the only child now. Uh, now, while the two have the two Tandy and and Tyrone haven't really been a part of each other's lives, they have very little memory of their kind of fateful meeting uh, when they were children. Circumstances arise within the first two episodes that see the stories of Cloak and Dagger intertwining. Now, for this breakdown, we're just focusing on the first two episodes, and we're just going to talk about our initial impressions. So, expect spoilers then from those two episodes. Uh, we try we, we won't give away like major things but we're certainly going to talk about specific details and we we are definitely not privy to any of the major twists and turns that are going to happen uh throughout the season so on that note justin what did you think about cloak and dagger i thought it was good i enjoyed it um for a freeform show now i'm going into this with a with a hefty thought on my head that this is freeform freeform uh, is like the old abc family formerly right? abc family yeah. uh home yeah. of gilmore girls and make it or break it I don't know if you ever watched Make Gilmore It or Break Girls It, was on, it was on ABC Family. I didn't know this. They would play it constantly, and I don't know if you would Make It or Break It is. It is the um, gymnastics based uh, family drama I, show. I watch Stitchers uh, on Freeform. What is uh, Stitchers? It's like this. It's bad. Uh, it's like this. <laughs> it's like it's this, this, this. It's this show where it's not. It, it just got canceled last year, I think, or a couple months ago. It's a show where a woman had the ability to quote stitch into the bodies of dead people, uh, and to kind of get their memories and so to figure out who killed them, that type of thing. Uh, That's it a was, pretty it good was, one. Like the premise is good. Don't get me wrong, but like there's like uh, the, the like the interpersonal relationship stuff, like honestly like the melodrama is just so silly but yeah i remember watching that and i and i watched i tried to watch a little bit of the show beyond but uh yeah i had to stop most of the freeform stuff is i can't take it it's very it's super teenage i'm excited about the siren show there's a show about mermaids on freeform Ooh. i am totally Anyways, gonna take a shot at this back one. to the show or something back, back to back to um i enjoyed it it was a it was a good show um the first two episodes were good i was intrigued um, it makes me want to watch at least this season. I'll watch this season, and I'm going to have my wife watch it too, because I think she'll like it. Um, she's usually not into 
uh, a lot of the superhero stuff. Um, she'll watch them with me, but she'll just be like, eh, I could do without. But, like, I think she'll like this one. Um, it, it kind of... It kind of is a twist from the original source material, because in the original source material, Cloak was kind of the uh, scallywag, if you will, and Dagger was the. I won't. I, I, no, I'm oh, not. Sorry. Gonna do I'm not scallywag. Like... scallywag. What? Well, he was, <laughs> what he's kind of like that, the man? the piece of garbage, because in this in this show, uh, Dagger's kind of the piece of garbage, right? And Cloak. He's just having that's, a hard time that's with That's a little this. judgmental. But. Well, she does tons of drugs and anyways. Uh and then, she had a rough childhood, man. She, she, uh, anyways. Uh so they kind of switched it cuz in this one Dagger has the questionable actions and Cloak is just trying to, you know, not disappoint his well-to-do family and stuff like that. So, or oh, this is hard working uh good family. So like it's it's a switch from that. In the original uh, comics, they got their powers through like a heroin substance because it took place in the '80s and it was like a it was like a big old allegory for drug use in America. Um, I thought the characters were interesting. Um, I, at first, I thought the girl was going to be terrible because the first opening scene when she's in the club and stuff, I was like, hey, this this ain't that interesting. But then. Further as she goes on, I thought she was really, really interesting. I thought she was a good actor, a good actress. And same for the guy. I was worried about watching the previews if the guy was going to be any good. But they both do a pretty good job. All those side characters are interesting too. Um, it's a little angsty. It is a little angsty, but I think it's just enough for me that where I'm not like, come on, kids, let's go. Because like my wife will watch Pretty Little Liars where. And, like, Pretty Little Liars, these teenage girls think they can solve the problem of murder, you know, instead of just going to the police. Like, that to me is just so stupid. Like, just talk to the police. Excuse me. Excuse me. I beg your pardon. That's pretty much all Riverdale is. So <laughs> I will defend talk to the police. that ground. I will die upon that. <laughs> I just don't understand. Why don't you just talk to the professionals? You're not... <laughs> They're they're incompetent, man. They're incompetent. They like, they're I, doing. And this one doesn't seem to have that stuff, you know? And like, I read Nancy Drew when I was a kid, so okay. clearly... Well, like, Cloak's doing stuff that's questionable morality and trying to take some of the law into his own hands, but, like, it's not like he's avoiding talking to people because there's a reason why he can't and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's angsty-esque, I guess. It's, it's, not, it's not overbearing for me where, like, I hate the shows where it's like, these kids know better than the adults. Like, no, you don't. When I was 16, I was very stupid. I'm 31 and I'm still very stupid. But when I was 16, I was not smarter than the adults because I've barely experienced life and I don't know how real world it is. So, like, when shows do that, it drives me a little nuts. This one doesn't seem to do that too much. It's more just based on, like, the interconnected drama between what's going on in their, their home social lives with a sprinkling of fantasy, which I'm sure over time it's going to get bigger and bigger. So, I, that's what I thought. What did you think of the show? Okay, so I liked it. Um, actually, I was kind of surprised uh, that I liked it, but um, because when we were originally trying to figure out what we wanted to review this week, you're like Incredibles two, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. That's all that. It was like, really good though. Jack, maybe Jack's Cloak and door. Dagger. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm like, all right, between the two, I'll do Cloak and Dagger. So we did Cloak and Dagger. Um, but I liked it. It reminded me a bit of Runaways uh, from. Uh, yeah, but I thought it was I thought it was done better than Runaways, though. I, I agree. Thought, I thought I like the agree premise and the setup was a lot better. Um, I also didn't feel like it was particularly hokey the way uh, other freeform shows I have uh, experienced have, including Stitchers and uh, and Beyond. It didn't have that kind of hokiness to it, uh, which was nice. It it actually if if you wouldn't have told me it was on freeform. Uh, it was on AB, you know, the former ABC family. I, I probably wouldn't have noticed yet. Um, it seems like it could be well, like on like a sci-fi and fit in really well into what they yeah, do, you know? Something like that. Like it feels like, yeah, it just, it, like it didn't, it had like a tenor or a tone that felt to me that it was a little bit kind of more serious and adult than some of the other stuff that I've seen. Granted, I'm not like an expert on freeform, you know, entertainment. But, um, so there's a couple things I liked about it specifically. Um, I thought that the manifestation of their powers uh, was kind of interesting and in how there were times in which they, they were hoping to manifest them. Did it manifest appropriately? <laughs> like, especially uh, with, with Cloak, uh, when he's getting his butt kicked and he's like trying to try yeah, to, I thought that was really to get cool. back like, out. They really <laughs> subverted the expectations on that one. They're like, know, oh, her just... powers are coming. Now his 
No, never mind. No, no. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. I thought that was a really cool thing that they did. I still don't fully understand like the power. So he's kind of like a nightcrawler, I assume. Like he can kind of. So can kind of she from, like... she can, according to the comic. Now, of course, we haven't gone in the show. It does it has not even delved into it at all. So like the, just the briefest glimpse of their powers. Yeah. yeah. So like in the comics, she has the ability to create light. And these lights, right. the light can manifest into physical form, like daggers or spears and stuff. Mm. He has right. the ability to absorb light. So the idea right. is she can't control how much she gives out, and he needs the light to survive. So they're dependent on one another to be together, and that's why they're inexorably ne- linked. So like that's why they're there. But oh, I thought he was like a teleporter. Or but something. yeah, no. But what he can do with his cloak is he can transport people through the dark dimension that is his power to other places. That's one of the biggest oh, things. Oh, there's a dark dimension. Yeah. Like, in the comics, it gets kind of and everything. Yeah, in the comics, it's kind of loony. But I'm curious to see where they go because they introduce a priest character, which is really interesting because in the comics. There's a thing like there's a demon inside of him. I don't know if they'll do that. I don't think they will. I think they're going to keep it pretty grounded. You know, as grounded as someone teleporting through time and space can be. But I, I think it's all he can really do is he can use his powers to absorb light and to travel from place to place. And he can take people with him. So it's not just him by himself. So Interesting. Um, so I guess... Okay, I have some some minor complaints, I guess, about it. I feel like her storyline is working better than his storyline right now. Because I feel like after two episodes, I feel like she's really taken off in terms of, like, she's got a lot of conflict she's dealing with. It's much more immediate. It's much more serious. And she's, and, like, you can see the forward momentum of her character. Whereas his is a little less. Um, so it feels like, I, I kind of think, like, his has to kind of get going a little bit more. I, I, we, I mentioned in the, the summary that he's sort of, thinking about trying to do something like you said take take uh take the law into his own hands and deal with the man who killed his brother and i feel like that's sort of slightly done but sometimes i wonder if if like i don't know i just i feel like that needs to get accelerated a little bit faster um they really don't interact a ton in the first two episodes uh there's really like that moment when they were kids and then like one other time uh and that's really it so that was a little bit surprising I'm kind of curious where it's going to go, like if they turn into like a crime fighting duo or if this just ends up being more of a, they're just two people in the world. So like, it sounds to me like they're going to be kind of like crime. It's a duo. very limited idea, right? Cause like in the comic books, they barely use them anymore. Literally in the comic books, the only time they use cloak is when like, we need someone who can take us from place to place, call cloak, that type of stuff. You know, it's never like they're, they don't have their own comic They're they're Cause like, I think about where can they go with this? Like, how many seasons can they do this? I worry about a show like this. You know, a lot of those shows that, like, they have an idea for a first season, but then once the second season comes out, they're like, all right, so what do we do now? You know, I feel like sure. they might have a whole arc here, and it'll be interesting. But, like, once you get past this first conflict, I feel like they're going to wrap up the law into his own hands thing by the end of the episode. I'm sure they're going, or by the end of the series, I'm sure they're going to wrap up her assailant by the end of this 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 uh first uh season right so like once they get past that i worry like where do they go from there how do they so i i, I just think like this might this might be one of those shows where they're like okay this worked what do we do now but like there's other shows where they have a beginning middle and end. they know what they're going they know what they're doing so that's one of the only words i have about this show in particular my other concern was that when i was looking at it like I'm looking at the genre categorization and it has it as romance, and I feel what? that's what it says. Like I'm look, I'm at I'm at the old Wikipedia. Where's at the IMDb, romance? And it said romance, and I was like, hmm, like between the two of them, like is that how it works? Uh, because I didn't really get any of that at all. What's I don't right? not at all. And I don't know if that happens in the actual you know comic. And I don't, They're I don't just know. kind I don't, of. I don't, like... I don't care so much about the actual comic because I always I'm, I always treat like the TV shows and the movies as they're kind of separate. Cloak is like so. perpetually in the friend zone in the comic books, pretty much. It's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Well, she has kind of a really supportive boyfriend right now, who I, I feel like is kind of willing to do anything for her. So you know that's kind of cool. She's totally hung him out the dry. But hey, you know whatever, that's fine. 
Uh, so I guess there's there's those two things. Um, I do worry about like if they do go that kind of romantic uh, route, that it gets a little bit uh, too mushy, kind of complicated, or too yeah, exactly. Which I don't want it to be. I kind of like the fact that it's just two people who are reeling from a childhood tragedy, and you were seeing the kind of consequences of it. So I, I kind of like that, and I like that there's no like big overarching uh, kind of crime fighting thing going on because that's, that's how I am. Like, I don't, you know, you know I don't mind powers like, like superpower stuff, supernatural stuff. I love that kind of crap. But what I don't like is, is like when it gets into the sort of stereotypical superhero crime fighting stuff, I always feel like that gets a little bit extreme and, and like, I kind of get tired of it. It feels sort of exhausting, exhausted to me. So like, if it's just these two people who happen to have powers who are kind of trying to find their way in the world and trying to find a way to kind of deal with the kind of consequences, I do feel like there's going to be something coming back uh with the inciting incident i'm not going to say specifically what it was but the inciting incident that kind of triggers um the deaths of the two principal characters uh that kind of drove them to their you know the cloak and dagger to their their respective positions um i do feel like that's going to come back because i feel like they made a bunch of they dropped a bunch of hints like there's that's going to be kind of an underlying or overarching mystery um and that might have to do perhaps even with the origins of their powers is what i was sort of theorizing without well, i know that like about the, the comics the Roxxon like. Corporation is like in Marvel is kind of like right an alien the corporation. You know what I mean? It's like right. it's that thing where it's this well, moving an alien, thing. It's, it's it's the Whalen Utah. Sorry, yeah. So it's like right. Whalen yeah. Industries where it's like it's this Whalen overarching. Utani. It's it's a hyphenated thing. Whalen Utani interested. Thank interesting. you, thank you. But like it's this thing where it's like it's this <laughs> overarching evil that it's too big for any hero to take down on his own, right? Like right. no matter how powerful Wolverine is or Captain America is, they can't take down this corporate interest, okay. right? That type of so thing. then it's probably less of like their personal story and just like a way to tie in with the, the cinematic universe or, or with, but like, I do think you're right though. I think it will be, I think you're, you're on the thing. I think, I think it, to further the show, like they're going to have this initial conflict, right? Of their two, their two linking incidents, not the what links them, but the two incidents that have put them in a, um, a compromising situation, both of them, right? And once that's settled by the end of the season, I think then they'll start delving into: Are there more like us, or like is, is there? How, where did we get these abilities? And and then going to rocks on and dealing with that stuff. I think that's the further idea, like you're saying. I think you're right with that, but like I'm just saying, like in the comics, rocks on is like this big thing where it's like corporate interest type of stuff so i think you might be on to something where it comes to that's where okay. we go later on all right so overall uh i would say i was pleasantly surprised by it and i'm probably going to keep watching it for the foreseeable future uh we'll see where it goes what about you i'll definitely finish this season um i'm okay. gonna try i'm gonna get my wife to catch it up to it catch up with it too so we can watch it together because i think it'd be a fun show cool and me and her can watch it together so i, I would right. i would recommend it so all right so positive positive recommend recommendations from both of us uh, that's Cloak and Dagger. You can find it over on Freeform or on Hulu. Uh, I think it's on it's on Thursdays. I think it's on Thursdays on Freeform. Not really sure. I did, Probably should look that up. Days uh, are not a part of me with TV watching anymore. I, yeah, I don't really do that anymore either. Anyway, uh, so that is Cloak and Dagger. I think it's time uh, that we uh, shift gears a bit and head over to the role play corner for the week. Now it's time for a little role play. Wait, nope, nope. That's the wrong role play. All right, so this week's edition, or whatever this is, of uh, my little role play corner here is going to talk about the end of a campaign, and more specifically, the end of my Starfinder campaign. This past week, our our session is is basically the it was basically the end. We're going to have kind of a mini session next Tuesday. That's going to be kind of two hours of epilogues, and then we're going to kind of play a little separate game uh, on top of it, because we usually play for about four or five hours. Um, but so this past Tuesday, the uh, seven-month campaign that we've been running, uh, that I've been running of, uh, of Starfinder uh, by Paizo, uh, has come to a close, uh, and it came to a close with a fairly uh, uh, fairly interesting kind of kind of bang. So uh, in, the previous, in the previous session, they, they've been being kind of coerced or blackmailed by uh, a group of cultists who um, were trying to get the crew, uh, my players, to actually do some illegal things, which involved abducting the CEO of a major biotech corporation uh, for reasons un unknown to them. Uh, and they actually did this and were very successful. And I was, I had this whole like 
arc plan where they were going to go to this auction for like Xeno archaeological artifacts and stuff like that. And I had a whole auction thing plan. And what they did is they just sort of showed up, found the, found the woman they needed to, to kidnap and they like talked to her and then they popped her and like, you know, they put her in a bag and they ran off the station. Uh, and so it actually, actually worked really fast and really good. Uh, so in the, in the ending, this, this last session, our final session was pretty serious because uh, there was not everyone made it. Uh, there, there were two significant casualties. So there, um, what they had to do is they had to deliver this woman uh, to to a location that was called uh, it was a prison. Basically, it was a it was a former prison that kind of was floating off in the in the drift somewhere uh, that thought was destroyed. And this kind of cultist, this group of cultists, have sort of made it their home. And they had a, so my my crew had to deliver this CEO. And when they did so they kind of had to relinquish some control of their of their ship and a, you know, a couple complications happened but if but what ended up happening is that their ship was destroyed uh, as they were uh, like on the, on the last minute sort of evacuating into this sort of prison colony and uh, the woman that they had kidnapped was harboring this kind of weird ethereal outsiderish creature inside of her uh, that the cultists wanted to to get because they wanted to kind of consume it, and they thought that by consuming it, it was going to somehow like give them uh, some sort of power and allow them kind of com to commune with their god in a more direct manner. And uh, so this wasn't something that they, you know, the, the players actually figured out, and they were being blackmailed because they had a bunch of their friends and families who were kind of over the course of the past seven months who were kind of started disappearing, and so they were part of a, an organization like a mercenary organization, and every. And, and and of all the ships in the mercenary organization, they start kind of going, they start disappearing. And like, what the heck's going on? Like, why are they being picked off? And so they've been, this company, like their company that they work for has been targeted. And so this is sort of the culmination of it. So they're, they're on the one hand, they're delivering this, this CEO that they kidnapped. But on the other hand, they're doing so with the intention to kind of trade her life for the lives of like her, their friends and family members. So it's kind of this weird kind of dark moment. And there was, there were points in the, in the campaign where they they were actually seriously talking about maybe we should just not do it and just sort of sacrifice our friends and family that were being kidnapped which was like you know to me i'm like okay that's interesting i'm not prepared for that but that's interesting uh we could totally do that uh so what happened was is uh they they kind of delivered the woman uh and kind of got double crossed their ship was destroyed because like it, embedded in the ship was like the, they were required to install this like little module that ended up being kind of a self-destruct and so then they were stranded uh, on this kind of floating asteroid in the middle of nowhere in like this sort of extra planar space. And they were on this like kind of prison asteroid. And so they sort of just charged into like the, rem the remains of the prison, hoping to find the CEO, hoping to find their friends and family members who were most likely locked away somewhere on that particular floating asteroid, find the other cultists, stop whatever ritual was kind of going down. And so they just start charging in. Uh, and it was really interesting because uh, I... I had set up like a really complex map, like battle map for them. Cause I've, I've been sitting on this, this terrain, these terrain kits I've had that my wife bought me uh, for my birthday a while back. And so I wanted to, to really use them before we ended the Starfinder campaign. So I had this kind of, mul I had this like design set up of like a prison yard with like big old watchtowers. And then I had like these, like, like a barracks and a cell block area that they had to kind of go through. And so they had to go through these one by one. And the idea was that they were going to start like, like, you know, to whittle them down a bit, but also to get, to get my crew, like the actual players to start whittling down the enemy. But it was interesting because they would go into one room and they would start fighting a bunch of the, uh, you know, a bunch of the cultists. And then they'd like chuck like a smoke grenade down or something to try to keep from being sniped from a distance. And so every time they did this and they did this two times, I just had like the, the surviving group of cultists just run into the next room and set up an ambush. And then they did it the second time. And so the the final the final encounter ended up being way harder than like I had planned it out to be because they were supposed to actually like the players are actually supposed to take out like that was the intention that was the kind of the idea the way I had sort of designed the encounters was for them to sort of take out a good chunk of the reinforcements and a good chunk of these these uh, these cultists before reaching the final boss and like his you know his lieutenants and things like that so and what it ended up what ended up happening is they had a, an encounter that was far more difficult so there's these big old towers that got turrets on top of them like the main tank who was a dragonkin flies up to one of those towers and starts like you know destroying one of the people who were doing the doing you know or controlling the turrets but then like the like the the harbinger who was actually the like the main boss like cast slow and just basically makes this guy not able to do anything for like the rest of the fight so um, we went super long into the evening this is the second time we've done this like like kind of a, a final campaign like the final the, like the final 
session of a campaign, what we think was the final session, ended up going way later than we intended because the fight just kind of kept going on and on and on because they couldn't quite uh, they couldn't quite get the final blow. Uh, but ultimately what happened is that their captain, Edgar, Captain Edgar von Ainsworth, this tiny little three-foot-tall skittermander, skittermander is this creepy little hyperactive um, little furry creature that has six arms. Uh, he died. It was very sad. Uh, he died kind of at the last minute, kind of within the last two or three rounds of combat. Uh, the is two front line character. I don't know. That's Josh's character. That's oh Josh's no! Character. Yeah, no. it's super sad because Josh was Josh was totally the MVP of the session because earlier in the session, um, their boss, who was an NPC character that that they kind of go to from time to time to get jobs, uh, Gantu Praboa, which is sort of a play on our friend Gabe's name. Um, he uh, he died, but like Josh's character is able to quick, you know, is able to resurrect somebody if if they get to them within a very short time frame of their death. And so he was able to do that. And so it was like total MVP moment. And there were a couple of situations where like Josh played like a key role in like making sure that the flight just didn't go, you know, to heck. But like, and so he dies like within the last two or three rounds. And I think the else in the has that ability. And so he's the only like healer type. He's a mystic. And so no one else can do that. So either you know, maybe they have the potential to grab his body and take it off the, you know, take it out of the grounds and back into the, you know, into the the galaxy and find some other way to resurrect it. Because we've had two deaths in the campaign because Keith's character is just the dragonkin, but they paid for resurrection, uh, which was a significant chunk of money. Um, so it's a question of, you know, can they do that with, you know, with Edgar? And there's some other complications. Um so it was really interesting because the final boss was protected by these two casters who, what they kept doing is they kept stunning anybody who would kind of get up onto the platform where the final boss was. And so the two frontline fighters were constantly getting stunned whenever they tried to close in on the, on yeah, the actual boss. Yeah, telling me about this. He said it was It was driving them nuts. It was frustrating the hell out of them. But at the same time, it was like, like part of me was just like, I feel kind of bad. But the other part, other part of me, I was just like, nope, this is strategically what they would do because it's actually making them win the fight. You know, so like I kept doing it. And so it was interesting because the last final, the last final rounds, both, uh, both Keith, who played like the big, huge damage dealing dragonkin tank, right? This guy who just ch like chunks people and tanks like crazy and he's the front line. And then his partner in crime, which is an android, a Solarian, which is a weird mix, but um, Long Lee, he, the two of them like were feared away and like Josh's character couldn't cleanse it anymore. And so the two of them were just like running way the heck away from combat while like, everybody left in the combat are all squishies and there's no front line. And there's this like big old crazy, like half, like, you know, cybernetic weird kind of daemon like creature, like moving around uh, this big old map, just trying to hunt down the tiny little people that were left. Uh, so it was really, really close. It's like, it, it could have gone like really, really bad. I think everyone at some point was downed, like kind of got reduced to zero HP. They had to use a bunch of their, a bunch of the resolve points to kind of get back into the fight, which is how kind of Starfinder does it. When you get reduced to zero HP, you have these resolve points that you can kind of get back into the fight on your own. Uh, but it was getting really, really low. Um, so w where we left the last episode was that the, the big boss was defeated, but um, they still need to get off that prison island uh, that's in the middle of nowhere. There's two other ships that are kind of floating, or three other ships that are floating around that they might be able to get access to. But the problem is, is that the ritual that this this creature was doing has, has kind of... Uh, sort of been interrupted in a way and it's caused like this weird singularity to begin forming nearby, which is creating these kind of gravitational swells. And so there's a timer on them getting the hell off of it. And so they still have to find the very people that they came to find. Uh, so th that includes one of the character's fathers, one of the character's mothers and a couple of their, uh, their employees and friends. And so they still have to find them, which they haven't found them yet. Then they have to get Edgar's uh, Edgar's body, and then they have to kind of break into another ship, and then they have to get in that ship and get the heck out. So, like, they're not necessarily out of the woods, even though the combat's over. So, what we're going to do in our next session is we're going to do um, we're going to do that little moment, which I which is sort of like a I do it like kind of like a skill challenge from D and D fourth uh, edition, which is sort of I kind of narrate things, and they use a variety of skills to kind of figure out if they can solve the various obstacle that I put in front of them. And then once that's done, depending on who gets out, who gets away, if anyone, um, what I like to do at the end of the campaign, I did this at the end of our D&D campaign, is I like to end campaigns with like an epilogue. Uh, and so these are character epilogues specifically. And so based upon like the circumstances and the things that a character has done throughout the course of the campaign, I give every one of them their own little story. And like, I ask them like, you know, what would they want to do in this particular situation? What would they want to do in that situation? 
Uh, so like Keith's character, the dragon kid was kind of offered a job uh, by, uh, by Dr. Soaps, who is like this uh, Ahsoki, which is a tiny little raccoon guy, uh, who is basically Indiana Jones. He, w- he offered uh, Keith's character a job to kind of be, you know, his, his muscle on his various, you know, archaeological adventures. Uh, Edgar, had he lived, still had to track down the guy who killed his grandson. Uh, then, uh, then, like, Coder's character, Benwick, his, you know, his, his father is missing uh, kind of went missing on his, uh, on his home planet after he was like working on this like submersible. Uh, so they have to, he has to go kind of find him, that kind of stuff. Uh, like Long Lee's character, the Android, he realized he actually had a brother Android and, or not so much an Android as a robot and like has instructions and how to kind of resurrect him in a way. And so maybe he goes and actually does that. So I have all these little nuggets down that while we won't necessarily get to them in the course of like a normal, normal session, I like to do them in epilogue sessions to offer some sort of closure to the characters and like the idea that this is kind of still continuing in some way. So, but anyway, that was the end of my Starfinder campaign, uh, with the exception of kind of this little epilogue last maybe two hours uh, on Tuesday. Then we're going to play another game, and then we're going to start our D&D campaign. So the next time I do one of these roleplay corners, I'm probably going to be talking about starting and the things I'm doing to start off this, uh, this next uh, fifth edition campaign that we're going to kind of mess with for a little while now. Uh, but anyway, Starfinder, it's fun to, uh, to kill your players. Uh, it feels really good. I don't mean their characters. I mean literally the players. It's really fun. And now, it's time for the Gentleman's Challenge. All right, the Gentleman's Challenge is one of our segments here on the old Lollygaggers podcast, where Justin and I assign the other some sort of homework for the next podcast episode. Now, this assignment usually involves us watching a TV show, playing a game, watching a movie, and then coming to the next podcast episode and answering a few questions about it to ensure we did our homework. Sometimes we assign things that are going to drive the other person crazy just because we think it's fun. Uh, And other times we assign things that we think the other person just might like because we're trying to be nice that week. Uh, But that's the gentleman's challenge. Justin's going to go ahead and lead us off this week. Justin, what were you challenged to do? So my challenge was a video game called Antihero. I got it for five bucks on GOG. Mm-hmm. Um, Good old games, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty decent website. It's got a lot of really cheap games on there. There's a couple on there I saw that were pretty indie. I was like, I want to try this out. Uh, but basically, it was developed by Tim Conkling, and it's published by Versus Evil. And it's kind of like a board game type of setup. It's, right. the, the way to describe it is a turn-based strategy game where one of the, where one where one thief, my mouth don't work so good sometimes. Where one thief tries to gain influence over the corrupt town by collecting bribes, assassination contracts, and blackmail. Uh, so basically, That's correct. The whole point of the game is you're a thief in a really stinky time. It looks, it looks like a Victorian area, uh, uh, a that stinky little city. Um, some people are French and some people are English. I can't tell where it's at. So, like, the the saboteur is French, but everyone else seems English. Anyways, uh, so basically you have, you have ter- its turns, you versus another thief. And so I played through the first player campaign pretty far, um, and basically it's me versus computer. So you're a thief, and you're going against another thief. You have a certain number of action points per turn. You can use that to move and explore uh, areas that you haven't seen yet, because basically the town is revealed once you explore certain areas and scout them out. And then you can also use them to, uh, the action points to attack uh, targets or to uh, scout out different buildings. So there's buildings like churches and banks and residences where you can get different pluses from. So there's basically you have two forms of money management and resource management. There's gold and there's lanterns. Gold is for you to purchase different little minions to help you out. And lanterns can be used to either collect briberies or accomplish other upgrades for your different minions that come out. The minions, so the ways you win the game, uh, the first couple rounds is just three objectives, but towards the end it becomes five. You have to collect five different objectives. You can get objectives by either uh, killing people that have contracts on their head, um, getting bribes by just giving lanterns till you get bribes. Or uh, if you have three, what are they called, urchins, spend time in a a church at once, you get blackmail, so you can use those. 
Um, the different types of character, you have your Master Thief, which is the main character you play with. Urchins are like little orphan boys that basically can occupy residencies to get certain resources from them. You have a thug who can uh, basically wall off an area, make it difficult for you to uh, progress through. There's a gang that basically beats people up, which can help get rid of contracts or remove people from uh, residencies through evictions. There's a saboteur, which puts bombs in uh, residencies. So if someone tries to evict someone from there, you basically uh, make it so they can't do that. Um, and they set little traps. And then there's a taunt officer, which might be the creepiest character I've seen in a board game style turn based thing ever. It's called a it's called a truant officer. Truant right? officer. Truant. Sure. Like truant. That was taunt officer. Uh, but it's really not that. It's really creepy because he's like basically picking up little boys and taking them away. Which I guess makes sense because of truancy. But either way, it's it very easy. Hey, yo, ball bait. This type of stuff. I'm like, oh, creepy. And so basically you use your different resources to go about the game and try to uh, collect your different objectives. Meanwhile, the person on the other side of you is also trying to do that while also trying to stop you from collecting your uh, objectives and different goals. Um, so what did I think of it? I thought it was fun. Um, I'm not good at turn-based strategy games. I'm what you call a big dummy, right? And uh, Justin, come on, man. Yeah. Anyways. I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I just, like, XCOM, like, this reminds me of, like, XCOM, right? Like, there's, <laughs> I know you're not, like, shooting aliens, but, like, okay. it's just a turn-based thing. I'm not good okay. at turn-based strategy at all. Um, okay. But this was fun. The art style is really cute. Um, I really like the way, like, big, like, giant chibi heads, tiny little bodies. I think that's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. I like the different ways you can, like, win the game. So, like, it's not just, it's not very linear based way to win the game. You can win the game in, like, six different ways if you really try your best. Um, the way you kind of set stuff up. You can set up roadblocks to make it so that you're making it difficult for them to do it, but also creating a, a streamlined way for you to succeed later on. Uh, I like that multi-tier level way of thinking. That reminds me a lot of like Magic the Gathering. When that was happening where it's like, okay, I'm going to put a bomb here to ensure this uh, blackmail. And then I'll up my attack this round so that next round I can kill this contract. And in the same round, get a bribery. So I'll have bribery contract. I have a previous bribery. And then, or I have a previous contract, and I now have my blackmail. So it's, it's like you're kind of like thinking three steps ahead. I like that idea of of multi tier uh, uh, strategizing. I'm just not good when it comes to uh, like that isometric type of strategy thought for me particularly. I'm not the best at it, but yeah, I enjoyed it, um, and I, I do see myself playing it later. It's worth the five bucks at the very least. It's worth five bucks because it's fun, and you can do it online and play against real human beings. That probably would be where I kind of get into it more. I like knowing that I'm making someone else miserable. I like that aspect. Like when I and play that is magic, why I do this podcast. Yeah, just for it makes me so hours, happy. To record, I am miserable. Like for me, I like that feeling. When I do magic online stuff, I like knowing that the guy on the other side is getting real pissed off. I enjoy that. So like, if I can do that with this game, so strange. It's it's fun. Like when we used to do PvP so on strange. when we used to do PvP on World of Warcraft, it used to make sure. me so happy. Like when we used mm -hmm. to do the. Uh, when we did our uh, Smurf uh, Paladin and Warrior. Oh, yeah. Fogelberg and Bolton. When I was Michael Bolton. You were Dan Fogelberg. <laughs> I was Dan Fogelberg. And we so were good. just 100% so oh, successful we on getting so flags back. Gulch. It was awesome. so good. But, like, I knew it just made people so angry and frustrated. But it was hilarious. Yeah. So, like, mm -hmm. I love that type of stuff. But So, yeah, I enjoy it. Uh, cool. I thought it was really, really fun. And I really liked the art direction of it. And I, I thought it was The really art reminds cool. me a lot of... Uh, darkest dungeon because it's kind of got that kind of yeah, cut yeah. Out quality to it it's not i mean it's not as gloomy and dark and it's like you said a little bit more yeah not not it. so uh have uh, the same sort of feel to it. spanish inquisition-y and not so much like that but i know yeah, these it. are the same this is the same company that does armello i believe uh yeah you, if there's like an expansion pack to get armello characters and stuff like that yeah which i thought yeah, was cool, cool. so mm -hmm. Anyways, what are your questions for me? <laughs> All right, so you already got one, which I was asking about the different types of victory points, the basic types of victory points. And you listed them, assassin contracts, blackmail from churches and bribes. Uh, I have another question, but I would like you to clarify. Okay, um, okay, okay. What do truant officers do? 
So you can take the urchins and occupy uh, residencies. And through that, you get different bonuses. Like each round, if you have like, if it's three kids in a normal residency, you get like, I think it's a discount on the cost it takes to get more urchins. And then if it's three urchins inside of like a bank, you get coins every round. Like each place has its own little benefit. But what a truant officer does is it goes in there and it evicts every urchin from that particular household or residency and makes it so that you can't get that bonus anymore. So that's correct. That's correct. really Excellent. rough to deal with. Okay. So next question. What's the name of the bar in the game and what happens when you fully upgrade it? Oh, no. I can't remember the bar. That's incorrect. <laughs> but when you upgrade a bar, is it you get lanterns? That is incorrect. The correct answer, uh, the name of the bar is the Strange Fellows Pub. Oh, uh, yeah, one, Strange Fellows. Wonderful name. Uh, and thugs and gangs get a health bonus. Okay. I was right. way off on that one. Then. Okay, so you're... Which so one's you're, lanterns then? Uh, that... I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it's just look. normal residencies. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. So, next question. Better hat, top hat, bowler, or fedora? And please defend your answer. That's real tough because those guys with the bowlers, those like, uh, those like NPC thugs that have like the mustaches, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I think what really makes it is the combination. You can't just have bowler normal guy. You can't just have top hat normal guy. I think both a uh, bowler, uh, bowler with the NPC and top hat with the gang member, those are close. Those are very close. Um, but the mustache for the gang member with the hop, uh, the top hat is much twirlier. So I'm going to have to go top hat on the gang member. Okay, that's the correct answer, but that, you got to it the wrong way. It's oh, kind of like oh no, it's kind of like when you get when you like you do a math problem. You know, as a math teacher, you get you get the answer and like okay, cool, you, you gotta got check the right it. You gotta check it. But you went about it the wrong way, and you just okay. sort of stumbled yeah. into it. Yeah, the correct answer is the top hat. Okay, that, you're you're 100 percent correct. Okay, there. okay, okay, is because the top hat is what the goat wears in the Lollygaggers podcast oh, logo. They... Hey, guys. That's why. I on, see. It's a, it's so a tricky I, question. I'm going to go ahead and give you half credit for that one. You half see. credit. All right. And then the last question. Best orphan from literature, comics, movies, etc. And please defend your answer. What best is the best orphan, orphan from literature, comics, movies, games, etc.? Please defend your answer. Uh, I'll have to correct. say uh, the elf from Elf because I just love that Christmas movie. It's really good. I'll say okay. uh, Will like, Ferrell from Elf. That's not even, that's not even remotely close. Uh, uh, the correct good. answer is Punky Brewster. I'm Punker. Sorry. So you did pretty well, actually. Uh, you Punker. started off great. You just you got two right off the bat, and then it kind of went downhill. This, I feel like the last two one was a half little, out of five. Two I know that last five. one was a little bit good. tilted the wrong way, but I'm just going to have to take your word for it that I was just completely wrong. So that's well, all right. Even if the correct answer isn't Punky Brewster, the correct answer is most certainly not Elf. Uh, it's a great others. movie. I like the movie. Oliver Twist, Little Orphan Annie. I mean, it's in her name for crying out loud. Uh, no, 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 no. He knows Santa Claus. I remember right now. Batman, Robin. He's I'm not an man. orphan. He's just Batman. What? Well, he lives in his home just with know, the, but, like hmm, British. How do we define orphan? It's interesting. Hmm. It's interesting. Well, Elf lives with uh, with people, so that doesn't. Yeah, but they're not his family either. members. You just and it's not his home. This Batman. What are you talking about? He still Batman? lives in Wayne Manor. It's not like he's he living in a live, strange place. But he, but he doesn't live with his family because his family's dead, man. They but like Alfred's like family, not esque. his family. He's hired help. He's hired anyway, help. It's still his home, so I don't. I consider that orphan at all. Incorrect. Your answer is incorrect. Okay. Oh well. Anyway, I tried. On to my turn. Justin, uh, oh, geez. This is, Justin, a, this is a gem. Uh, Justin challenged me to watch uh, a wonderful film uh, by is the it, name was of... Was it a De film? Is that what Death, it was? <laughs> Death Race 2050, uh, which is part of the whole kind of Death Race culture. 
Uh, there was a movie about 10 years ago or so, or maybe 15 years ago or so. There was a movie from the 70s. So there's other death race movies, et cetera. And this kind of continues or remakes or I'm not exactly sure. It says, I've read that it's the sequel to the 1975 film Death Race 2000, uh, but I don't know if that's true. It's it's directed, well, I should say at first it's, it's produced by Roger Corman, which is a fairly big name, but it's directed by uh, G.J. Uh, Ecturnkamp. Sorry, uh, that's crazy. My favorite director. Uh, and it stars Manu Bennett, who I recognize as Deathstroke from Arrow. Uh, that's from Slade Wilson right Arrow. there. Uh, and uh, it's also got Marcy Miller, who I don't recognize. But when I looked her up, she's in Days of Our Lives, or she was in Days of Our Lives, which, funny story, is the soap opera I watched when I was a kid with my sisters. Uh, let's see, what else? It's got Malcolm McDowell, who you recognize him from literally every bad sci-fi slash action movie of the past 40 years. Tank girl. And it also, it also has Yancey Butler. And I don't know exactly why I'm mentioning her, but I did recognize her, and I felt really good about myself for recognizing her for some reason. So there you That's go. That's the Yancey like the leader of the resistance, is that what it was? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so what's the story? Uh, it's the year 2050, <laughs> hence the name. That's a good question. What is the story? Yeah, um, and it's no longer the United States of America, but it's the United Corporations of America. And apparently the UCA is uh, overpopulated. There's a really high unemployment rate. Uh, I'm looking at the old Wikipedia and it says the unemployment rate is 99.993%, which is kind of high, I think, a little high. Nah, that's, uh, uh, we're, that's fine. So as part of the governmental structure, what they've decided to do to combat some of these problems is they put together a cross-country death race uh, that goes from old New York to new Los Angeles. Uh, and they all have these fun little names uh, along the way. Uh, like they're not really called that anymore. Um, and so like Utah, like they made a Mormon joke and there's other places. Uh, West Virginia had a funny one too. Like Washington, like Washington D.C. is formerly known as Dubai. So, which is really yeah. confusing. I was gonna do of... that one for a question, but I was like, that one's really easy because you see the there... big old spire. Right. So, so anyway, there's there's this whole thing where like they're doing this because they're trying to, I guess, curb population, which honestly doesn't make any sense because during the course of the during the course of the race, there's only like five racers, and you get like ten points per person you kill uh during the race and like i think the max score was like 200 or 300 so at most they're killing like 30 and so maybe you know if you say each person that's 30 each, people each, were really making that's it like rough 100 on 150 people that kills so like it doesn't really make sense it's completely illogical uh so so that story doesn't make sense so they, so they got this thing going on where they're driving around and like the worst oh god the the the, the car designs are terrible Anyway, Manu Bennett plays Frankenstein, who's kind of, he's kind of the recurring character. You've seen him in other, other iterations of, of Death Race. Um, he wears a mask for a little bit and then they take it off. So he's kind of like the beloved, beloved character. Um, there's a couple others as well. Like there's like Tammy, who is like this lunatic, um, who's like this, you know, crazy Christian person who prays to like Tom Hanks and stuff like that and all sorts of weird things. Um, and like the whole idea is like they're just tra they're just racing across the country. Now, meanwhile, they all have like these people who are kind of their proxies uh, who sit in the car next to them and are basically there so that onlookers, people who are watching the show of the death race can actually kind of sit in the same cockpit with them and kind of watch them. So Frankenstein's uh, Frankenstein's proxy works for the resistance and the resistance is trying to sort of topple the regime of Malcolm McDowell, who's kind of like a Donald Trump type character because he's got funny hair and he's like the head of a corporate America, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like stuff happens. Um, people die. That's uh, the best way to describe it. Stuff happens. It's it's the dumbest. Like, it's so dumb. Um, there's a dude named, okay, so the racer's names, there's Jed Perfectus, who is just like <laughs> all about perfection. And he's just, which he's not. And then there's Minerva Jefferson, who is like some sort of like pop singer. And she was she amazing... your favorite actor in the movie? Was she the <laughs> best actor in the movie? Her song was fantastic. She was like, drive, 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 kill, kill, drive. That's her whole song. She says, just drive and kill over and over again. Uh, Tammy was Tammy was another one. Uh, and then there was Abe. I think it was Abe. Yeah, Abe was like the robot. Was like a pure robot car who like kills his driver early on after it like self-aware. 
Well, first he was pleasuring her because that was part of the whole thing. Like he was like they were having sex. Apparently, she was having sex with her car, of course. Uh, but then eventually yeah. he something glitches and he kills her by ripping her face off, which I don't understand the physics of that. Yeah, uh, and I, then he becomes her face got ripped off. What else is there to understand? I don't understand. Yeah, making no sense here. Um, there's like a romantic storyline too, which is the most ridiculous thing ever. But anyway, what did I think of it? Like it's so dumb. Like. But on the other hand, like even though it's really dumb, and sometimes it really kind of made me laugh. So I ch- I checked it up on the old IMDb's, and it's got a three point seven out of ten. I think that's <laughs> I think that's a little unfair. I think this is easily a four point five, like easily a four point five. I would give it a four point five. Quite five audacious, my friend. My friend. It was very funny at times. It's, okay. it, there's some really terrible stuff in there. So here's the things I don't like about it. First of all, the car designs were absolutely horrendous. Like they looked terrible. The the racing scenes were terrible. They didn't look like they were going very fast. Like it, they had like rubberized stuff. Like it was the they looked absolutely terrible. So that did you like when like those drones movie. came and attacked them? It was like someone was smacking them on the face with them. <laughs> yeah, just made no sense. Then like in the in between the uh, like the segments of the race, they would have like little moments where they were at checkpoints and they were having like quiet talky talky time, serious serious time. Like just stop doing that because it was the it was the worst parts ever. Uh, at one point, uh, Frankenstein's proxy was directed by Yancey Butler, the head of the resistance, to put a piece of machinery up her vagina uh, <laughs> to use to try to lure Frankenstein uh, to have sex with her. And this little thing had like a chompers. So like last week when we were doing the review of Ice Pirates, buy his pee pee off. same thing. It was, it was the same thing. So whatever. Uh, so do I recommend this? Like, not really. Kind of. Not at all. Like, it's so bad. In a way. Like sort of, it's so bad. I kind of feel like you should watch it just because of how bad it is. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not a particularly good. Movie. Did you also like the special effects of him working on his hand? There were special effects. What the hell was so special about him? Like there, it was like, <laughs> oh, they were terrible. Are you kidding? Oh man. Um, All right. So you ready for these questions then? Yeah, that's fine. Let's do it. All right. You kind of touched on this one a little bit. How many points is each type of person worth? There was three major points and the type of person it was so what was the point th- system how did it work i don't remember the exact numbers what i think regular people are just 10 points uh i think babies were worth like 50 or something uh or children uh or maybe they were worth double something like that and i don't remember what the third kind is because i know it's just regular people and it was and i have no idea what the third one is i'll give you half credit i'll give you okay. that's fine uh 10 points for a normal person right 20 points for children Right, it was yeah, double. It was double. It was double. Yeah. And fifty points for the elderly. So okay, it was, it was the elderly. I knew. And then, and then extra credit that. would have been knowing that uh, the final guy was worth a thousand points because they said it about a trillion times in the movie. Yeah, so. yeah. So that, that's your first question. So I'll give you, I'll give you half credit for that one. That's, that's good enough. Okay, I'll take it. That's fine. Second question: Why doesn't the chairman want to race golf carts? Why does he want to race golf carts? Oh yeah, I remember that line. Because Frankenstein and him like to go golfing on the weekend. So why doesn't he want to go racing well, golf Well, according to Manu Bennett, uh, Frankenstein's character is because uh, his hair is all would get all messed up and fly away. You are absolutely right, sir. Yeah, he, he did the thing with his hand. And goes, yes! He, he doesn't like the wind. Too much wind. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right. So you got that. All right. So that's your one and a half. Next question. Where was Wal Martinique located at? Wal Martinique. Um, Oh, geez. Was that Arkansas? That's absolutely right. Do you know why it's in Arkansas? Yes. Uh, no. Why? Is that so that's where, where Walmart, Walmart was made. Oh, that's I didn't know that. So, this is good. This is good. I didn't think you were going to get that one. That, that was a tough one. Yes. I was like, is he going to catch this one? Walmart Tanique. Uh, dude, when they started showing like the little subtitles of all the different places, I'm like, I have to pay attention to these. Just going to use this. Get at least one He's question one of these. from these. Like, I thought the Dubai one, but that one was just too easy. Dubai was, was too easy. easy. I can't remember the West Virginia ones. I was hoping you were. There was also the first one was like, it was like Nueve York. There was there was New Shit Town, which was Baltimore. (laughs) (laughs) It was fantastic. It's good stuff. That's a classic. There are funny things in the show. Like there are funny things in the movie for sure, but it's a terrible movie. But it's funny at times. So your last question. Okay. What place did Grape Ape finish? Because this is clearly the Hanna Barbera race. And Grape just Ape. so, where did Grape Ape finish in this race? Um, because okay. I couldn't see him the whole movie, I feel like he was still there. 
Uh, okay. So, uh, so Frankenstein clearly finished first, right? Uh, because no one had crossed the line first, so yeah, he yeah, had yeah. to have finished first. Because he, he got those thousand first, points too. Everyone would have known, and exactly, uh, nobody else finished. Tammy, you know, everybody else. Perfectus was close, but didn't. Uh, the other two didn't either. And then Abe, who the hell knows where Abe is anymore? So I'm going to say Grape Ape. Then, thereby, by default, finished second. You're absolutely right, sir. Second. He just was. Yes. He was just trailing behind. He, his his big foot can't fit in the pedal that well. It's true because it's a it's giant true. ape that looks like he's a yes. grape. It's a grape it's ape. Yeah, I don't know. The, relevance, the, the movie yeah, right. constantly gave that. me like thoughts of like Hanna Barbera race. I was like, this is this is a Hanna Barbera race. Because like for as bad dressed. as it was, there are moments of like sheer genius and hilarity. Now those moments are few and far between, and you have to sit through a lot of other stuff to get to them. <laughs> Uh, but I'll tell you, it's kind of fun. Like, it's, I don't know, it's kind of fun. If you're, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would almost recommend it if you have a good sense of humor and if you like bad movies. If you like, if you, if you, know, like if, if you movies, know what you're getting into, that yeah. it's Death Race 2050. Yeah. And you're willing to take that. It's, there's some moments they're like, oh, that was pretty good. But most yeah. of it's kind of just complete garbage, like faces being ripped off and heads falling off. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. But yeah. It's just silly. And, like, inexplicable nudity for just no reason. It's just so weird. So. Yeah, there, it was really strange at times. So do you have a new challenge for me? Okay, so uh, what I would like you to do next, because you're such a big fan of superheroes. Yeah, of course I am. That's why I saw Wild Let's like card games. Uh-huh. And because I'm trying to get you uh, into more tabletop stuff. <laughs> uh, and because it's kind of difficult to do that, so I try to do it via like tabletop on various platforms. I have a new new game I would like you to play. Also very cheap. You can get it on a couple different platforms. You can get this on Android and play it on your phone. You can get this on Steam and play it on your computer. So it's up to you. You can check the prices, see what's cheaper for you. Because there it's it's all it's all less than ten bucks. Um it might even be might even be like free to play on Android and like you buy. I'm not really sure. But anyway, the game is called Sentinels of the Multiverse. And I would like you. It's a, it's based on a card game, uh, like it's, a, it's the well. I should say it's the the iteration, like the, like the iteration you're playing is based upon the kind of tabletop card game. It's been out for several years now, uh, but it is a game that reminds me very much of Champions Online, the MMO superhero MMO that we played a little bit here and there, and that Wobbly wanted to play more than we did, but uh, that we played many years ago. I well, we just wanted to play it because you can make a lobster. Because you make a lobster, man. I know, I know. It's the only reason to play that stupid game. All yeah. right, so uh, Sentinels of the Multiverse. Okay, I've yes. written it down. I'm ready to go. Are you yes, ready sir. for your assignment? I was born ready. So No, I, I wasn't. I was like, I don't know what to give him this week. I can't go superhero or angsty. I do that all the time. I can't. All the it. time. I got to try time. and switch it. So I'm just I'm scrolling through Netflix. And I get across the crime dramas. And I find something that might be the most amazing crime drama I've ever seen. It's oh called. Oh my god! I think I know what this is. It's Go called ahead. the Sniffer. Okay. I knew it. I knew it. I had it on my list. I had it on my list to give to you, but I couldn't it because I was in the middle of a new trilogy. A I detective drama. Who solves crimes by sniffing. Yes. Oh which, my god. Which man. I'm pretty sure that was a the satire. Dumbest idea for a TV show <laughs> ever. I'm pretty sure that's the ever. satire. Like they made that joke on like. Oh my um, god. I think it was like 30 Rock or something. They already made that like actual joke and they made it an actual TV show. So oh my God. you're going to watch The Sniffer. I cannot believe I saw this too. <laughs> and like, you know how Netflix does the autoplay of the actual trailer? And like, you actually see him like tilting his head up a little bit and sniffing <laughs> as like these women walk by while he's waiting in an airport terminal. I'm like, this looks terrible. Oh my God. I can't believe you're making me watch this. Oh, this is going to be so me? good. I just like, oh what can I give him? The like, thing was... is, Justin, the thing is, it's been on for three seasons somewhere. Oh my apparently. god! There are three seasons, like not three episodes, three seasons of episodes. It's so I hope you enjoy the sniffer. I hope you really get that one. That's what I get for giving you a nice, good video game to play. And now another <laughs> good card game to play. I have to watch Death Race twenty fifty in the sniffer. All right. And on that enjoy note, that. Uh, it's time to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, so you can find us up on the old interwebs at uh, lollygaggerco.com. That is our little blog site. We post all of our episodes up there and a couple other videos here and there from our friend Uncle Probo, Papa Probo, whatever the hell name he's going by these days. Uh, you can also get us on the old Twitter 
at Lollygagger Co. Uh, it's L O L L Y G A G G E R C O. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, and if you can, and you don't mind, and if it wouldn't cause you too much angst, uh, could you please drop us a little review? You can also get us on Google Play, Stitcher, and all the other places that you might find uh, your podcasts there. Uh, so even if you don't want to get on old uh, old iTunes and do that, which would be really helpful if you could, uh, drop us a review uh, wherever it is that you uh, you feel like dropping us one. Uh, Justin, on the other hand, or something like that, is uh, also a professional streamer. Uh, and he's been doing some streaming no. lately because Twitch is bombarding my darn email inbox uh, with <laughs> notifications. Uh, so, Justin, where can they find you on Twitch? Uh, Twitch.tv slash Jehufa. That's J-E-H-O-O-F-A-H. Uh, I started up Alien Isolation last Thursday. I played about an hour of it. And uh, I haven't even seen the Alien yet. And I almost pooped my pants. So It's such a good game. I got to... How far are you in? I got to... Uh, the British guy got impaled, right? And now I was waiting for just the tram to come pick me up. And just the music and, like, the anxiety of the tram not getting there fast enough was driving me nuts. I was just sitting in a corner like, please, please, no, 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 no. You're ridiculous. It was rough. It was scary. So You haven't even started the game yet, and you're already freaking it's out. It's like I'm like an hour in. It's like an hour. So All right. Okay. Anyways. And on that note, let's say some thank yous. You ready? You know it. Okay. To credit card and debit card chip readers, especially those at my local grocery store, it's a fries. You are the most reliably unreliable piece of machinery I've ever encountered. You never work, and I always ended up having to slide it anyway, but I always have to go through like the three attempts before it lets me slide it. But anyway, thank you for not changing and never improving in the four or five years that I've been trying to use it. So thank you. To the kids that destroyed our school vans uh on saturday morning making it so i had to drive teenagers to a uh a football camp all the way in orlando and also making it so they sweat in the back of my nice leather seats i want to thank you for the terrible inconvenience you put into my life and also have to drive these kids now to a new camp on tuesday well, thank you so much all right to the people in my neighborhood who drive around in golf carts thinking that they're the same thing as, as riding around on a bike they're not it's not exercise, but at least my dog doesn't freak out as much with golf carts as bikes. So, you know, there's that. Thanks. And finally, I want to thank my wife. She went to St. Augustine this weekend. And she picked up some, she went to a hot sauce store and found me some Mad Dog 357. And one drop made my tongue feel like it was going to rip off my body. So finally, I found something that hurts me. It's got scorpion peppers and ghost peppers in it. It hurt. It was really good. Anyways. <laughs>